Hi, it's Pat Duckworth, the author of Hot Women Rock, How to Discover Your Midlife Entrepreneurial Mojo. And the wonderful entrepreneur that I'm talking to today is an EFT tapping coach and mindset magician who works with heart-centered business owners to clear out those hidden blocks to marketing and sales that make you procrastinate and wobble on your prices and hide behind the computer and play small. She works intuitively and one-to-one -one at a really deep level, so you can really finally feel confident about setting your rates and talking about what you do and making an offer in sales conversations. And of course, ultimately, that means you get more clients. We all want those. And you make more money and an even bigger difference in the world doing what you love. So let me introduce you to Linda Anderson. Hello, Hi. Hi, Linda. So I was just thinking earlier, you and I must have known each other about seven years now. Quite a while now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we met when we were both at a women's networking group. That's right. At the, was it WIPN? Yeah, it? yeah. And, and I was really impressed. I had your book just come out, Hot Women. Cool solution. It might have done, or I might have just been working on it, I think. So right. I might have had that first copy and been really <laughs> excited. <laughs> I was so impressed with the title. It's such a brilliant title, isn't it? Just <laughs> Thank you so much. So, Linda, tell us a bit about your journey. You haven't always been an entrepreneur, have you? No, I haven't, not at all. And actually, um, I almost accidentally became an entrepreneur because to begin with, I had what you might call a hobby business. Um, so when my kids were little, I started kind of exploring things that really interested me and I got into reflexology and Reiki and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I was seeing clients at home part time, you know, when the children were at school and I had a wonderful life. I was having piano lessons. I was going out for bike rides. Oh, and I just thought, this is it. This, I've made it. This is what I've always dreamt of. And then uh, my husband lost his job and he was out of work for quite a long time. So at a certain point, I overheard one of the family members saying, well, can't Linda get a job? <laughs> and that's when I um, thought, OK, I've got to do this. I've got to be the grown up. I've got to be responsible now. That's the end of the dream. So I, I got this job in um, an office down the road, which was really in a pretty toxic atmosphere. And I absolutely hated it. It didn't bring in enough money anyway. Um, and I was desperately trying to keep the other things going on the side. So what with that and juggling the kids and the house and full-time work and seeing clients in the evenings, I just burnt out. And in the end, uh, my body said no for me because I'd felt obliged to say yes, you know, when yeah. I knew it was, it was not going to work out, it wouldn't be enough money anyway. So um, after about two years of kind of trying to keep all these balls in the air, I, I got really ill. My body developed cancer. And it was when I was looking for something to heal the roots of the illness, because I knew conventional treatment would only buy me time if I didn't really look at what was causing it. And that was when I came across tapping and it just absolutely blew me away from the first moment I tried it. And within a few weeks I was on a training course and you know, within a couple of months I was a practitioner. And, um, and then I eventually ran training workshops as well to train other people how to use it. Um, and I didn't go back to the office job, but that, that had its own challenges because obviously I knew a lot about what I was doing and I was really good at what I was doing, but I didn't know anything about marketing. Mm. And for a long time, I couldn't work it out. You know, I kind of really struggled to get clients, to get enough income coming in that would make it sustainable. And because I didn't know about marketing, I, th I thought you kind of, you put your shiny new website up, you have your business cards designed, you know, and then you sit and wait for the phone to ring. And of course, it's never going to happen like that. But no, and that's a mistake a lot of people make, isn't it? So yeah. how long ago did you set up then, Linda? Um, well, I started with a reflexology in 97. Yeah. Um, and then when did I start tapping? 2003. Okay. was when I started tapping. So it's quite a long time ago. And yeah. I, I would say at least the first half of that chunk of time since then was spent kind of trying to fly with one wing because I really believed it's enough to be good at what you do. Yeah. People will come to you. <laughs> They'll just magically turn up. Everybody will talk about you. They'll tell their friends and, and you won't have a problem. So, and in the end, that makes you doubt yourself. You know, you think, well, yeah. maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not really as good as I thought I was. And, you know, it can get quite disheartening. And I think a lot of people get driven back to full-time employment when that happens. Yeah, absolutely. And... 
well, you and I have talked about this before, and one of the problems I've got with the whole kind of branding of heart-centered business is that for some people it's shorthand for, I don't make much money. Yes, it can And be. how can you serve the people that you know you can help mm. if you can't make enough to live on? Exactly. So that's why I love what you do. So tell us more. Well, that, that's kind of become my mission because that, that was my journey as well. You know, I was absolutely passionate about the reflexology and all that, the healing side of it. And I really wanted to do more of it and just couldn't understand why it wasn't working. And I know if I got the information at that point that actually you need to be as good as getting your message across and getting in front of people as you are at doing your thing, then I could have taken off from there. But I didn't, I didn't get it. So it was a long, hard journey finding out, you know, that it, it's not there's anything wrong with me. Actually, I just need to acquire some new skills. And they're not yeah. skills we're born with. You know, you just need to learn how to talk about what you do in a way that, and get in front of enough people that you're, the people who need you can find you. Yeah, so some people do seem to be naturals at it. Uh, you know, they started selling eggs outside their house when they were five oh, yeah. years yeah. old and <laughs> they've never looked back. But for most of us, it's a skill. It's, it's a capability yeah. that we have to develop. Yeah, and I think there's also a thing about um, wanting to make a difference, you know, being in the healing arts or whatever, however it is that you want to make your difference. Uh, there's something there about um, it, it, should, it should all just happen and I shouldn't have to focus on the icky stuff. You know, the, we kind of see it as manipulative and sleazy because that's how we've experienced marketing and sales ourselves. And actually, you, it's the first part of your service. If you, if you can't learn how to sell well, then the people who need your help won't get it. Yeah. You won't get enough clients to sustain yourself full time. And you'll end up like me, you know, having it as a hobby again. So at what stage, because, you know, some of the people watching might be thinking about, well, how do I develop a niche? And what should my niche be? And will it just come to me? But at what stage did you decide to niche more into helping entrepreneurs with their attitudes and their relationship with money quite a long way in actually it was when i got business coaching and that was probably after about five years of yeah. <laughs> desperately trying to do it by myself and i just didn't understand the concept at all and i think getting clear on a niche as well takes time it's a yeah. process it's not something you just decide right i'm going to do this it, i think it needs to evolve and the more people you work with the more you get clear on who you want to help and what you want to help them with and what really lights you up? You know, what, what is your purpose? What's, what's the driver behind your business in the first place? Because, you know, it's not really about the money. The money's important, obviously, because we've all got bills to pay. But that's not really why you came into self-employment, is to yeah. make that difference that, you know, you're here to make. So. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question about that later, because I'm really fascinated by what, what success means to entrepreneurs mm. because you know you can get caught up in the money thing and and we've both been talking about it. it's important to make enough but it's not really what lights us up in the morning no. to get out of bed so we'll be talking about that shortly mm -hmm. so was it from working with different clients or was it from the marketing and the coaching that you had that made you realize this was your niche yeah i think it was a combination of the two it was um, opening up to that idea, that concept that I need to specialize in something. Yeah. Um, because intuitive, it feels counterintuitive, doesn't it? It feels like we're going to be excluding a whole raft of people. We're actually, we're just making our signal out into the field much brighter and clearer. And it doesn't mean that you can only work with those people because they've all got friends and family who've got different issues who they might send to you. But at least those, those people recognize you. They recognize you've got a solution to their pain. So, um, and I just saw so many other people like me struggling in the same way. And I didn't want them to go back to paid employment the way I did, you know, give up on the dream. I wanted them to be able to, to really stand confidently in what they do and own the value of it so that, and get the marketing training, which would come from somebody else. That's not my area of expertise. Yeah. Um, but so that they could take the action they need to take and get out there. And it's scary to begin with, you know? Yeah. Because it almost feels like you're making yourself a target in some way if you've got any visibility issues or if you've got any self-worth and, um, and the money stuff, you know, you won't feel right charging or you won't want to charge too much or you tell yourself stories about how much the person in front of you can afford or can't afford. And actually, you don't know. You really <laughs> don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> and we kind of make those decisions for people in the beginning, which, which is completely wrong, you know, because you, you have no, no idea what somebody's financial position is. And it's not your decision to make, really. Absolutely. That separation between their stuff and your stuff. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I love about my particular niche. Sorry, I'm gabbling on packs. So no, no, I know you're excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I love this particular niche, because I know that for every person I help who's a healer or a therapist or a coach or whatever, that's potentially going to ripple out and affect hundreds of other people's lives as well. So I just love that thought. You know, it's like dropping a pebble in a pond and watching the effects ripple out to so many other people so that we can all kind of do what we're meant to be doing on the planet and get paid for it. And, and since you established that niche, what difference did it make to your business? A fantastic business, a fantastic difference, because I got really clear on, on what, what I want to do. You know, what's the difference I want to make? And, and I, I suppose my kind of underneath it all message, my gorilla message, if you like, is that I want everybody to know there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. Because that was my stuff all the way through. I thought there was something wrong with me and I had to be this other person that other people wanted me to be, which is what kept me at that crappy job for two years, you know, when I knew there was no point really. Um, so once you do kind of really not just have it here as a mental concept, but just feel it in your body that there's nothing wrong with me and there's nothing wrong with anybody else. We've just got all these bullshit stories we've been telling ourselves over the years because of stuff that happened a long time ago. Mm. And, you know, kind of mistaken meanings we gave to what happened when we were six years old. Yeah. And it all runs in the subconscious mind. And then you're accepting the opinion of a six year old about practically everything in your life without even knowing you're doing it. Um, it's time for that to change. And I, and I want to help people get free of all that stuff. Yeah, we've got to so let those six year olds just have fun and let play. Them and play, exactly. Go do what they should be doing <laughs> instead of trying to run our lives yeah, now. Exactly. So, this is Pat Duckworth, the author of Hot Women Rock, talking to Linda Anderson, who's a tapping EFT specialist and a coach. And she helps women with, well, no, I'm not going to say women because I'm sure you help okay, men as well, yeah, yeah. helps entrepreneurs with their money issues. So, just give us an idea what are some common limiting beliefs that people have around money well, there's layers and layers of this stuff pat and i take people through processes to kind of excavate it almost because it's some of it is so deeply hidden we don't even know it's there but a lot of it um for the beliefs you could say we just download that in childhood yeah in the first six years you know your brain's in that hypnagogic state you're not assessing anything you're just downloading it onto your hard drive so whatever you're hearing around you, like you have to work really hard, it's got to be a struggle. Um, people like us don't, whatever it is, or rich people are, whatever you think rich, they thought rich people were. And that kind of goes in on your hard drive. You, you don't consult it anymore, it just runs. And it mm. runs 95% of our behavior. So whatever you're hearing a lot of, maybe money doesn't grow on trees or um, you can't be rich and spiritual. Um, I'm sure you can think of lots of others as well. Well, I, I, I know I've, I've told you this story, but um, when I was in that kind of age range, uh, it was Christmas. And it shows how strong these memories are, because how much do you remember of actually being five, six years old? But these sort of significant moments occur. And my Auntie May gave me a 10 pound note, a uh, 10 pound, 10 shilling note, gosh, a 10 pound <laughs> note, that would have been amazing. But a 10 shilling note was pretty important, you know, back then. Yeah. And um, somehow it got scooped up with all of the wrapping paper and the envelopes and must have got burnt. You know, we had one of those old burners in the corner of the kitchen yeah. and it got burnt and I, I couldn't find it anywhere. And obviously I was heartbroken. And I said to my mom and dad, you know, I've lost my 10 shilling note. And they said, well, let that be a lesson to you that you have to look after money. Mm. That was it. They didn't give me right. another 10 shilling note because I had to <laughs> learn the lesson. <laughs> and um, what meaning do you think little you gave to that part? Well, you know, money can be scary because you can get really yeah. excited by it and, and then it's gone, it's lost and right, yeah. it was your job to take care of it yeah. and you're not going to get it back. Right. You know, so many little messages from that. And you see what um, happens, what would have happened there to little you, and I know you know this, Pat, but I'm saying it for people listening, that little version of you, part, that part of you splits away yeah. and, and to hold that disappointment, that devastation down below conscious awareness. And maybe some shame as well for having lost it. 
uh, yeah, it gets stuffed yeah. away. But then that little part's like a security camera and it's always looking out to make sure you never have to go through that again. Yeah, so, I haven't then, got a burner in my house. <laughs> 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 no, but I'm thinking, you know, in terms of getting a lot of money and then suddenly losing it or having it whipped away. Yeah. In, in ways that you, you didn't even, you couldn't foresee. Yeah. So, so that part then will, will feel resistant to actually receiving money. Yeah, you don't want the excitement and then the, the, the crash that comes yeah, after it. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, and you don't know it's there. You're not consciously aware of it, but it's those things. Uh, a governing 95% of the way we show up in our lives. So. And then, of course, we look for other examples of it being true. Exactly. Because your brain's all, always saying, is <laughs> that true? And then, you know, I, I can now, I can feel my brain running, oh, do you remember when you lost that doll? And do you remember when you yeah. lost this? Yeah. You know, all those little bits of loss where your parents were, well, I told you, you had to look after lessons. things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but we also we also kind of consolidate the pattern. So the first time that happens, it becomes like a template or a yeah. blueprint. And because that part's always looking out to make sure it doesn't happen again, that's in your emotional vibration. This could happen again. Yeah. And that's what we pull more more evidence in, more experiences of the same thing in different yeah. circumstances. But you know, getting money and then suddenly, oh, I didn't learn that lesson. <laughs> yeah, how stupid am I? I forgot it. Oh my And then goodness. we start to tell ourselves we're no good with money and, and it kind of compounds from there, doesn't it? Yeah. So you've had to acquire a number of capabilities to do what you do. So obviously there's the professional side of it and learning about EFT, learning about coaching. And then on the side, you've had to learn these business skills. So marketing and sales was one. What else did you have to learn in order to run your business? Oh, you have to know, there's a million things, isn't there, as an I entrepreneur? Know. You have to know about accounting and tax returns and all that boring stuff. Um, but as you get to a certain point, you can also get people to help you with that. So, but I think it can be a bit overwhelming to begin with just learning about the computer and the website and how to put blog posts up and and some of those soft skills as well like you know the networking yes yes getting connection with people and getting yeah. in front of people that's really important and i think not only from a business perspective but for you as an individual because it can be quite a lonely path if yeah. you're working from home online which i do you know so i went to a networking meeting on friday for the first time because as you know, I had an accident and that was the first time I've been into London since September. My gosh, it was such a relief to feel <laughs> that physical connection with people again, you know, and feel like you belong to something. Yeah. You, it was just amazing. Well, as you know, I was at um, a conference last week and, and the previous week I was at another conference and they just really fire me up. You yes. know, if it's the sort of audience if the if the people who are there are like-minded people yeah it just gives you such a buzz it's fantastic yeah it kind yeah. of recharges your batteries doesn't it and, yeah definitely yeah. And, it, and i think it also helps keep you connected to your bigger why of why are you in this in the first place you know what was your purpose on the planet yeah definitely and i was with a lot of those people in the last two weeks and um, it really keeps me going yeah. so and one of the questions i was asking i've done a number of really short videos with people i was meeting there to ask them what success meant for them so yeah. what does success mean for you now I think what it means for me now is, well, there's for me personally, but then there's also for, for, for everybody on the planet, because I want everybody to know that there's nothing wrong with them, you know, and that we're all here with something special to give. And that when we find a way to give that and be paid for it, that works best for everybody. So mm. to, on a grander scale, that would be success. But for me personally, it's exactly that, that I found the thing I love to do, the thing that lights me up. I found a way to get in front of enough people who need the help I can offer. And I'm comfortable charging for it. So, so that's my living now. I don't have to go up and down the road to a crappy office job <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't even paying the bills anyway. You know, what a waste of time. Yeah, absolutely. So that's success. That, that I've got that. And I've got, a, I've got a balance as well. I've got more balance in life than I had before. Yeah. Not, just always working, always working. Yeah. So that, that creeps in sometimes, I have to admit. That's quite a deeply ingrained pattern in me um a yorkshire yorkshire girl you know it's got to be hard it's got to be a struggle <laughs> so that's one of the things i'm still working on but i was very lucky last week i met um brian smith who's the founder of ugg boots all right and his story was absolutely fascinating and 
you know, there is struggle in it and there's hard work in it. Yes, yeah. But when it's something that you really want to do when you're on a bit of a mission, yeah. you just do it, you, you know, because it, yeah. it's meaningful for it you. Is. And and he saw off serious opposition, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I didn't really know about, mm -hmm. but people who try to rip off his, his brand. But he was so determined yeah. and... Um, all of us wanted to take him home from the conference. We just <laughs> loved him so much. He was great. <laughs> so Linda, what's your top tip or tips then for new entrepreneurs? My top tips. Um, well, uh, the first one would be to get yourself a business coach as early on in the journey as you can, because that's going to help you be so much more focused and, and they're going to save you a lot of time, you know, because yeah. they, they will have been on that journey themselves as well. So they will know the pitfalls. They'll be able to guide you. Um, so that's the kind of outer stuff in what, what you need to do, but you will find that when you start doing that, they're going to ask you to do things that scare the pants off you <laughs> on the whole. <laughs> and I think that happens for most people. So that all comes down to the mindset stuff. And that, that's where self-employment then becomes a spiritual journey for me, because you have to keep working on yourself yeah. in order to become that person who holds that bigger version of themselves and, and is able to, to run a successful business. Yeah. And when you set out there as self-employed, you're not in the context of an organization or a company anymore. So it's not as easy as before. You know, I've had some people who've had really high profile careers in companies and suddenly when they're out there by themselves, they go, Oh, who am I to be doing this? You know, and all that fear of being found out comes up, mm. all the self-worth issues come up. And that gives you access to stuff that you wouldn't have access to normally. So it's a wonderful opportunity to really get to know yourself well and, and let go of some of those mistaken meanings we were talking about earlier mm. and, and just show up confidently as who you are. Cause then you are the business. You have to talk about you as the business. Yeah. And that's definitely. where it becomes a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So all the lovely people watching, if they want to find out more about you or contact you, how can they do that? they could hop over to the website it's tapintoyoursuccess.co.uk and there's also a free quiz on there that helps you get underneath the procrastination and the wobbles and all the rest of it well what's actually going on underneath so if they want to download the quiz and let me know how they get on i'd love to hear what comes up for them some of it can be quite surprising yeah we just have no conscious awareness of at all it's yeah stuff. it's the unconscious stuff yes. that's the problem if you're yeah, conscious you're probably already <laughs> working on it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah. linda this has been such a pleasure thank you so much for sparing spending time with me oh, thank you pat really enjoyed it and um so keep watching out for more of these interviews with wonderful entrepreneurs and all the lessons you can learn so you've learned today a bit about niching and you've learned about acquiring skills and the importance of finding coaches, business coaches and, and acquiring those business skills that you need so that you're not a broke, broken hearted, heart centered <laughs> entrepreneur. You're somebody who's flying and offering that service as widely as you can. See you next time. Mm -hmm.